Okay, I think I'm going to begin. Um, the slides are, on, are available on the calendar link. So if you come in late or I talk too fast, please click through the slides yourselves um, and that'll give you most of the information. So I want to introduce an, a new idea, a new term called Canvas Kit. This is not an official term. This is just what we call it, but hopefully you'll find it interesting um, uh, and maybe give us some feedback on it uh, when we're done. So Canvas Kit started out just as an experiment uh, on my team. I work on the Skia graphics team. We wondered when we saw WebAssembly announced if we really could build our entire C++ engine in WebAssembly. Over time, we discovered not only can we, but it's actually pretty great. Very rapid turnaround time, very quick to iterate on JavaScript bindings, JavaScript test code, and having it all backed with a C++ engine. Um, so that's what I'm going to tell you about. Right. Um, it is an open source project, but we deploy it in multiple places already. One of them is our web site for Skia, skia.org. So I'm going to take you through a couple of links on that right now. Hopefully this will work. There we go. So this first landing page is, in fact, documentation slash sample code. Here's some code, uh, JavaScript code. But inside this section, it will look a little different syntactically. Now we are making a new kind of API calls for graphics. We're calling it Canvas Kit. It is somewhat inspired by Canvas 2D and somewhat very different than Canvas 2D. Um, so this case, I think, draws a, a rounded rectangle. So we And here's the drawing, this red shape. Um, and that's the first sample. And this goes through and breaks down. This is a tutorial, what each subsection is doing. Uh, and here's one, I think, that does an animation. So here, we're doing a request animation frame so that it loops around and we can vary the position of the red rectangle. So this is something you should be able to try out on your own. You can crib the sources here, how we loaded, I think it's up here, how we load uh, the WASM library. And there are multiple versions in our repo, but you can also compile it yourself. OK. Um, earlier you saw, well, not here, but here um, is one of the demos you saw spinning during the cartoon section before the movie began. Um, here's the code for that. Uh, oh, actually, this is not. This is a different piece of code. This is the, the dashing. So here's an interactive test, and it has sliders. But you can peer into the code here. And here's a complete application, sort of, um, with reading the mouse coordinates, et cetera. Um, and I'll take you back to this demo one, this site. So in here are some very small cribbed up demos. Again, these are perfect for uh, inspecting and looking at the source code. Here's the hello world. Um, and if we right click and inspect this, we can see the source. And here the source is pretty short. We have to just make a surface. So we call a, a rendering target. Um, but and then set up a color and a font and draw our version of Hello World, which in this case, no, that's the error message. So um, this is how you can get started. And I'll just note, if you stumble into the, another place on skia.org, you will see something that looks similar but different. Here's our actual C++ documentation. And in here, and here are some example drawings. Here, if you click the image like this, we also get code, but now you're actually getting C++ code, which runs. So I can make changes here. So the rectangle is blue. Um, let's see, there's the color. So we can change this. And hit run. So now it's black. So this has some great properties. This means 
you can type actual C++ code on the latest version of Skia. And if you find a bug, this link up here is a permalink. You attach that to a bug and we can see your case. The downside is obvious. It takes forever because we can't run it live in the browser. We have to shut it off to a secure uh, cloud instance, run the code, send the picture back. It takes forever. It's good for debugging, bad for playing. So there is uh, C++ examples, but there is also JavaScript, JavaScript examples. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Canvas Kit, once we got used to playing with it, also actually found a shipping customer. So Flutter, which builds a framework for mobile apps, is now deploying Flutter for web transpiled apps uh, for browsers. And it one way it does that is with Canvas Kit. So they have built a custom build of Canvas Kit. And they take an existing Flutter app, which is written in Dart, transpile that to JavaScript. And then instead of shipping their native engine, they ship an instance of Canvas Kit underneath. So all of the Flutter graphics um, get executed by Canvas Kit. One second. So and here are some links to some of the Flutter documentation for this happening. Yet another use we have found for this is, in fact, to not just play around, but to actually use it to try out polyfilling and experimenting with new web APIs. So I have a couple of links here, and I'll walk you through them. But the general idea was when somebody proposes an idea for something in CSS or HTML or Canvas, anything graphic related, we are sometimes able to prototype that very rapidly using this Canvas Kit web, WebAssembly um, library. Try it out in live browsers, get a feel for performance, get a feel for the ergonomics of the JavaScript bindings before we have to really commit to writing complicated code in the browser to flesh it out. So here are some examples. Uh, one thought in the CSS world is, can we control high quality filtering better? Today, Chrome happens to use a Mitchell bicubic filter, which has a couple fixed coefficients on a given cubic equation. Um, these two sliders at the top, as I pull them, you can see the bottom right image changing somewhat. These actually are my little mocks for controlling these two variable coefficients in this family of bicubic filtering curves. So we're able to quickly, and there are other versions of this uh, demo, try out different settings with different test images and see what do we think of the sharpness versus the fuzziness? Does it ring too much, et cetera? Um, and some crazy ideas. So, so the bottom right is this bicubic uh, sampling of a tiny bitmap scale the way up. The upper right corner is just bilerp. So this is hardware filtering, um, very ringy, but predictable. The bottom left is a wacky idea. It was. What if we found some hybrid between pixelated and the biler, the top two cells? So this slider does that. So we're slowly fuzzing. Um, we're lerping, basically, between pixelated and fully filtered. It's an experiment. It's a way for us to play quickly and see results in a browser. And all of this sits on top of Canvas Kit. So again, if I right click this to inspect it and look at the code, now it's a little bit more code than before, but not much. You can see some drawing calls in here. We're setting shaders and rectangles and a little bit of mystery red code in here. We'll get back to that. So please find these links and, and inspect them yourself. We took that particular experiment a little further. There is now a, a um, discussion group specifically about this crazy idea of pixelated upscaling with a little bit of smoothing. So we tried to implement that and see how efficiently can it be done. At first thought, we thought we would have to do two passes where we have to scale up mostly, make a buffer, and then scale that up a little bit with hardware. So this experiment shows an alternative to that. So as I pull the 
upscale factor. That's what the slider is doing. You can see the striped image on the top is the actual image, and the lower one is just a blown up version so we can see the pixels. Um, but now what we're looking at, top and bottom are roughly the same. The bottom is this, this what we thought was the only approach. Do two passes, scale an image up, make a new buffer. Now scale that up a little bit with Bilerp. The top has written a custom sampler inspired by that multicolored one that tries to get the same results and do it in one pass. So we think we're pretty close. Um, again, try inspecting this code and you can, you can sniff out what we're doing in that sampler. The last quick demo as a playground for new browser APIs that my team works on. Um, we have a proposal out, the beginnings of one, for a text shaping API to make it easier to do international and rich text, hit testing and formatting and drawing fast in multiple contexts, including Canvas 2D, but not just there. And so we wrote a very simple text editor using this API. So in this window is a very crude editor, and but I can I can hit hit test the text, highlight, detect different styles. Uh, in this case, we can change this to bold, uh, change the size, maybe make it a color. Not an impressive text editor, but if you inspect the JavaScript, you'll see all of this is in JavaScript with a single new proposed API that took in a whole formatted description of the paragraph and returned very low level uh, outputs so that the rendering step was still up to me. In this case, I'm rendering with Canvas Kit, but I could just as likely render with Canvas 2D or WebGL or something. This is just trying to say, are we, we want to discover, are we providing enough information in a new proposal to do something useful? And here we're using Canvas Kit as a playground to test that idea out. OK, so much for the practical. Um, of course, we have to end the demo by talking about sort of the far-reaching things that we were inspired to try out. Once we have Canvas Kit, we might as well abuse it. So let me give you a preview of some of the things that the underlying engine can already do, but we are just starting to flirt with in terms of would this be interesting to expose as a browser API, to expose as new capabilities. Um, and so we're using Canvas Kit again as sort of a polyfill to expose it quickly to test apps and get a feel for the ergonomics. The first one, I really have to show you all this, this secret sauce when we do custom filtering. I'm going to call it custom shaders, uh, shader meaning this sampling step. So here's a very simple code, um, a simple example. If I hit, well, there. So you saw this animation earlier. What we have built is, in fact, exactly the equivalent of a generic gradient that you would put in Canvas 2D, linear, radial, conical. In this case, of course, it's behaving in its own way. It happens to animate, and that's just for show. The fact that it can be spiral is an intrinsic property of this new kind of gradient that we could not produce with Canvas 2D today. However, this is running at full speed. This will run exactly as fast as any of the built-in gradients that exist today. And the reason that happens is that Canvas Kit is exposing a user programmable shading language. Think of it as a vast subset of GLSL just for 2D pipelines. So I'll highlight just that part of the, of the code. So just this section is a text string that I send to Canvas Kit. It compiles it, gives me back a factory. And now I snap off instances of it to apply to the drawing context, where the instance sets some of the runtime variables. What are the two colors? How tightly are we twisting the spiral? Didn't have to hard code this. I could have those loosely bound. So I'm not recompiling the shader for every animation frame. That would be too slow. But I am re-instancing it, um, at, which is a very lightweight operation, so that I can quickly change it and draw with it. So and that instancing step is here, where I take the factory object, which I only had to build once, which has sort of paid the price of talking to the graphics card, getting 
whatever it had to be compiled, compiled. And now I toss in some floats and snap off this object we call a shader, assign the shader and draw. Um, and in this case, we get an animated spiral. But this is precisely the mechanism that was used to do that custom filtering for the bicubic and to do the smooth fuzzy uh, upscale. Again, wrote a little bit of code, get it compiled through the browser API, but now it runs at full speed and then use it to draw. In that vein, we can do more. So here we see some lighting and butt map effects on this textured brick. We also see that it's actually rendering in 3D perspective. And this is real 3D perspective. This is done with a four by four matrix, uh, somewhere down in here. Okay, you know, well, here, here's some setup for the matrix. Um, and again, this is written, the custom rendering, the particulars of this bump map and lighting calculation is not built in. It's just exposed as a, as a code fragment that you write. So here's our code, rather small, and it's what you think it would be. We have attached some side images to this effect. We've said, I'm gonna make a new effect. It has a child attachment, which is a texture, which happens to be the brick, and another texture, which is just an image, which happens to be normals that tell us where to put inner shadows. And we just sample in, do some dot products, computer brightness, and now we have a lit 3D cube. So by combining the custom shader capability and the fact that we have a real four by four matrix and we can decide who's front facing, um, we can do a real three, this is not a replacement for GL, but we can do 3D looks inside this 2D uh, environment because we didn't need much else once we had the matrix and the custom shader. No good graphics team is complete unless they've written a particle simulator. So here's some particle, particle simulators. Because we had to write a VM, an inner VM to compile that shader language, and it runs on the CPU if you don't have a GPU backing. So we have an, an interpreter and a JIT that we fall back to for CPU execution. Well, it turns out you can use that to run just about anything. So here we've taken sort of classic definitions of generators and particle systems, take in a little program from the caller. In this case, compile it for the CPU, not the GPU. Uh, and then we can do animated particles. The reason this runs so fast, which it does, is that the underlying rendering step is all done in one call. So all the dots, the multicolor dots for that cube or the explosion or the gas flame, this is, you know, I don't know how many, 5,000 little different shapes drawn. All of these are bulked and drawn with a single API call through Canvas Kit, uh, pulling from an atlas or something. Again, so that we can mitigate the overhead of a JavaScript browser binding cost and still get very high-speed animation um, in this 2D system. Last, um, I just want to show you the, the, the grandfather of animation systems, which is After Effects. So another side project on the team was to look at this very popular open source plugin called Body Movin', which has now been renamed Lottie, where you take After Effects projects, export them as a JSON file, and then try to run the animation in real time. So we have such a player, we call it Scotty, that's a play on Lottie, but we took that code, which sits on top of Canvas Kit, and we put all that in the browser. And so now I'm playing at full speed these After Effects animations um, right in the browser, with turns out better performance and better fidelity for some of the exotic features than you could have done with Canvas 2D. Some of the new features that After Effects likes to export are just not expressible in Canvas 2D. So we needed Canvas Kit and its expanded capabilities to simulate those and get those to run. And that's it. Um, just to quickly summarize, this is all available and all really not official. Um, we have an open source project. We are shipping official 
versions of Canvas Kit as part of the Flutter deployment project, but they have their own version. So feel free to look at the sources, build it yourself, give us feedback. Um, again, our only real goal is to keep it agile so that we can really use it as a test bed for projects like new APIs for the browser, et cetera. Um, and there's a, a link here to another slide deck written by the uh, architect who implemented the actual binding technique, Kevin. So please read that and give us comments if you want to understand more of the particulars of how we pulled off the bindings between the two. Some of it is WebAssembly, and some of it is sort of Canvas Kit specific. So you may find that very useful. Uh, I think that's it. Are there questions? Just calling up from chat, uh, Jeremy had asked about the WASM bundle size. It's enormous. It's several megabytes. Um, this is why, again, today, it's really not super practical. I mean, big apps, it's definitely practical. Tiny apps, it's definitely not practical. Um, I will tell you, um, I showed you the text editor API. I may re-demo that. Um, that has inspired us to fission off that part of the functionality in Canvas Kit, which is text shaping, et cetera, and make it its own kind of separate piece of functionality and perhaps just get that added as an actual web standard. Because if just that one step, shape a rich paragraph of text and give back the answers, were built into the browser, we actually speculate the entire size of Canvas Kit would get cut in half. And this is just due to all of the transitive necessities to do that correctly. We need a big piece of ICU and we need HarfBuds. And those third-party libraries are very dependable and very large. And so we think we may have found a way at least to cut the size in half. Um, and hence that text thing. And I'll pull that demo back up. Super cool. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Uh, just for fun, trivial question. Uh, Respective correct texturing on those 3D transforms? Question. Yep. yep, we're going through. We're going through jail hardware. It sees the full four by four matrix. Neat. Um, let me reshare that window. Hey, Mike. Um, yes. Thanks. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I was curious about accessibility. So for things like Lottie exporting animations to Canvas, that sounds like an amazing project. But in terms of Flutter exporting the whole app and completely running everything, um, I'm reminded of sort of the flash days of full screen apps. And so could you speak to accessibility, especially for text? Yes and no. I, I completely undersold the work that the Flutter team has done for this. They do have an accessibility story. I, and so I'm not going to guess how they do it. I only take care of the rendering. Um, but I know that the accessibility object model is probably what they're leaning on so that you can use JavaScript to communicate with the browser what you're trying to do with text, even though you're not using markup. Uh, if there's a Flutter person, uh, Jaeger or others in the audience, please speak up. Um, if, you, if you really need a more specific answer, uh, somehow e you can email me. I'm read at Google. And I will find the right person and give you an answer. We're certainly not pretending that we have solved it with these proposals. So I, I probably misspoke to say it was just a transpile step. Thanks. Yeah. I know we're close out of time. While we're paused, I have to just, you know, I have to show the secret demo that you wait till the end. So here we are back in this text editor. Um, I can make make some text some larger again. Uh, and magic key. And hopefully you recognize that animated gradient. This is in fact the animated spiral that we saw earlier using the custom shader language being applied to text um, after the fact. Shaping call just shapes the text. But now that I have raw glyphs and positions, I get to draw them however I wish. So since I'm in Canvas Kit here, uh, I can throw all the bells and whistles at it.
Cheers. Thank you so much. Super fascinating uh, presentation, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. OK, I'll let everybody go early. Um, if you do have, uh, you need to email questions, send them to Blinkon, and they'll find me, and I'm happy to try and answer them.